This episode of Talk Your Book is proudly brought to you by Honan, providing a complete range of insurance, risk, and financial solutions. Bundy's called me up, told me to take a look, but stay stubborn as bulls and talk their own book. Get the money, get the money, get, get the money. Well, Steve Johnson, mate, thanks very much for coming back on Talk Your Book. Uh, we'll get into uh, the episode shortly. It's a little bit of a different one this week, but thought if we could start with an intro to, to Forager Funds Management for those that, that aren't familiar with it and, and how you guys look to invest. Hey, Chris, thanks a lot for having me back on. We're uh, a fund manager based in Sydney. Uh, I started the firm 2009, so 13 years ago now. And look, our our modus operandi is to buy things that are either misunderstood or very unloved and hold them for long periods of time if we need to, to realise that value. So, you know, that can be small cap, large cap, can be in any sector, but we tend to stick to things that we understand. And most of the best opportunities tend to be at the smaller end of the market because it's less covered and because there's less competition. So, you know, you'll, you'll see a bunch of stocks in our portfolio that are certainly not household names. Um, and that's where we've been able to find the best opportunities over time. So unlike a lot of other funds that are, you know, we do exactly this tiny little bit of the market, we, we tend to use our, our flexibility to go and try and find the areas of the market that people are most likely to be mispricing at any point in time. And today we're really going to focus on managing money through a bear market and, and the challenges and opportunities that pose. So maybe if we go back to a, a recent example, when you came on uh, Talkie Book a few months ago, the stock you really liked was Whisper, which has been crunched a bit and bounced back since then. Maybe talk us through that journey as a, a Whisper shareholder and how you've managed that position since you were your last on the show. Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of these over the years, Chris. I'd say some of our best opportunities, the, the biggest money-making stocks we've owned have been ones that have fallen after we first bought them and where that initial thesis that we had was actually right, but you got an opportunity to buy it at a much lower price. I remember first buying Jumbo Interactive at $2 a share. This is going way back 2012 might have been. And the share price was $0.90 cents not long after our first purchase at $2 a share. So it had more than halved. And they had a, an Australian business that was actually really profitable, making lots of money. And they just started this business over in Germany that was losing a fortune. And I went up to see the CEO in Brisbane, Mike Viverka, and he said to me, I just don't understand why our share price is where it is. And I said to him, well, if you look at the headline number here, you're not making any money. And he said, but that's because we're losing all this money in Germany. And I said, well, exactly. Stop losing the money in Germany and things <laughs> might change. And yeah, that's it. they've had a bit of a tumble this week, but I think it's 12 or $13 a share now, that business. So we're often early and we've clearly been early in Whisper. Um, it was more than, it was, I think it was north of $2 when we came on here. It hit a low of $0.74 cents, uh, late in June, I think today trading around one ten. So, so far, it's been a very costly investment for us. We have added a lot to our Whisper investment, and, and that is because we do think the investment case there is on track. And for me, this is the most important thing. I, I think value investors like us, we can be really guilty of just doubling down on things that have fallen because you always, that's what you do. It's in your DNA, you buy stuff that's cheap. And I think trying to distinguish between, okay, this has fallen, but the business case and the investment thesis here is on track is really important between that and and respecting the fact that the market might be telling you that something is wrong. And, and that is often the case as well. What are some of the clues that, that people could look out for or that you look out for? Is there like relative strength is something you look like if it's if it's a similar type business to to five others and its numbers are similar and it's dropped a bucket load more than its than its peers, are they some sort of clues that perhaps you need to dig in further just to make sure you're not doubling down on a loser or, or or what are some of the other clues you keep an eye out for? I think that general, just what is the market environment is the first question you need to ask yourself. Because if your stock is tumbling in a market that is up or where there's lots of bullishness about your particular sector, you know that every single fund manager in the country is looking at the stock, every single broker's all over it. It's in a space that people like and they're not buying it, then there's probably a pretty good rational reason for that. If you're in an environment where everything is falling and a whole sector is unloved and you understand the reasons why it's unloved, then it's far more likely that your stock is just caught up in that and that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with what's going on. So I think understanding just the, the context, and I think that's true on the upside as well. Some of my biggest mistakes mm -hmm. are buying stocks that you think are cheap in a bull market 
and you're sitting there saying, well, this is cheap relative to everything else. Normally in that sort of environment, there's a reason for it. So number one, understand the backdrop that you're operating in. Number two, for me, really important is actually having that, that thesis written down at the start and understanding what your key markers are along the way. How am I going to assess whether this thesis is working or not working? And being really clear about what those things are, because when it comes to the time when something's going wrong and where the share price is down, I can guarantee you that you're going to justify it. You're going to have some rationale that my original investment case is, is on track. And if you haven't written it down and you haven't given yourself clear markers for where you expect this business to be at that point in time, then you're going to just rewrite history. You're going to rewrite the reasons why you originally bought the stock in your own head. And that can be a very bad mistake. So for us as a firm, writing it down, and I, I say to people, if you can't tell me, we're long-term investors, but if you can't tell me the markers that we need to see over the next two or three years, then it's not a, a verifiable thesis that we have here. So they're the two things for me, have it written down up front and understand the environment that you're in. And what about your sizing? Like sizing, you know, if you've bought as much as you can possibly buy of something and it drops 30%, you're in a bit of a pickle. Do you just start with sort of an 80% of, of what you think you want to allocate to it so you've got more money up your sleeve down the track? Or do you put sort of a full sizing on at the start and if it does drop, you, you get the money from selling something else? No, I definitely leave the capacity for, you know, I know that once every three, four, five years, I'm going to get the opportunity to buy something at a screamingly, screamingly cheap price. And I want to have big portfolio weightings at that point in time. So, you know, with a whisper, we had 2% of the portfolio in it back in January. And at today's price, we've got 6% of the portfolio in it. So when you consider that the share price has actually gone down substantially over that period of time, we've probably upped the number of shares that we own by five times. So we will generally have a, a relationship between the weighting of the stock, the discount to fair value that we're seeing, and also just the liquidity and the quality and the certainty of the business. So those three things work together. And when we originally buy the stock, we might say with a whisper, it's probably a maximum 6% weighting at purchase for us, given it's currently not profitable. We're expecting it to grow a lot, but there's a lot of things. It's not, it's not JB Hi-Fi, right? Where I'm certain that that business is going to be profitable and around in 10 years time. So we would have a maximum weighting of five, but in January, we only had 2% in it because it was... 30% less than what we thought it was worth. Once it gets down to a 60 and 70% discount, then that's the point at which I want my maximum weighting. So we try and leave ourselves capacity to, to really up that weighting when the screaming bargains come along. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to take advantage of those types of opportunities. And so you mentioned doubling down on, on stocks that you've done the work on, understand and, and think offer great value. Of, of equal importance is that ability to be able to cut the stocks that are no longer doing what you thought they were going to do and, 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 and often cutting them at a loss, what sort of biases have to be overcome psychologically to, to make that happen? It's certainly something I think uh, professional money managers are able to do a lot uh, easier and better than, than retail in, in, in broad terms. I think you'd be surprised how common the problem is in professional funds management land as well. They've got all of the same biases that, that other people have. We try and mitigate some of those through teams and through processes and things, but it still it still happens. And you know, I've been doing this for twenty five years, and I think it's still our number one our number one problem area is things that have that we've known pretty early on were not going the way we wanted them to go, and we've ended up owning it for four and five years, and we've ended up putting more money into it. In some cases, helping recapitalize the business. Not only have we lost money, but it's just consumed enormous amounts of time and your attention and, and your, your mental health in terms of being rational about the market. So you know, don't, don't think that this is not going on in professional land. I think the, the biases that cause problems are, number one, human beings don't like admitting that they're wrong. We are very, very strongly wired to believe that we're right. And you see this all the time when share prices are going up, you'll see fund managers talking about how good they are. And when share prices are going down, it's all oh, the market's not working. And, you know, the small cap index has been beaten up or, or whatever it is. So just recognizing that you're wrong is, is very hard and accepting that is important. So how thinking in advance, how am I going to know that I'm wrong back to having a clear thesis laid out? I think that's, 
that's really important. So if you're a retail investor just blaming Regal isn't a, isn't a good strategy for what you're <laughs> no, just blaming anyone. <laughs> and look, I think the other one that I see all the time is I want to make my money back. Yeah. I know this is not working. I know that I was wrong. And as soon as I get my money back, I'm going to sell it and move on. Yeah. <laughs> and that, yeah, that, that, that is anchoring. If you go and read Danny Kahneman's books, Thinking Fast and Slow, you will see a lot of things in his book that you recognize in your own behavior. And one of the really, really common ones is, is anchoring. They've actually been able to get people to anchor to really, really random numbers that they put in front of people. Like if they ask people, what do you think the weight of a jumbo jet is? Something that you don't really know. Yeah. And they've primed them with a number that is 100. People that have been primed with 100 versus people that have been primed with 300 will guess 100 tons and someone else will guess 300 tons. And we're just anchored to completely random numbers. And when you've bought a stock at a certain price, you've seen that price, that is your anchor. And you sit there and say, well, it's going to go back there because I've seen it before. And yeah, we've seen a million cases where it's absolutely just not going to happen and, and you, you need to accept it. I'll give you an example. Uh, one that we have cut recently that hasn't worked for us is AMA, the smash repairs company listed on the ASX. Uh, we've just, we had a thesis there that the margins were going to improve out of COVID, that smash repair volumes were going to come good, uh, that this was a business that's going to benefit from scale. There's a couple of US and Canadian players that are very profitable smash repairs businesses because it's the bigger you get, the cheaper you can buy parts for. We're just not seeing any evidence that that is happening as they come out of COVID. In fact, they've got contracts with insurance companies that were signed pre-inflation. I'm now using that as a, as a term, pre-inflation. And they've got to fix the cars at a price that they can't make a profit on because the parts costs have gone up and the labor parts costs have gone up. So that's a good example, I think, of one for us that we've gone, okay, we, we have actually lost half of our money on that investment at the time we cut it but we've got better things to do with the money and, and let's move on. And I think that's another important thing to help people deal with this is not just look at that investment in isolation, but say, what, well, what else got to do with the money? Is this the best opportunity for me here and now? And my experience has been you wake up the next day and you know whether you've made the right decision or not. Once, once you've got a zero waiting, if you feel like buying it back, then maybe you've made a, a bad decision, but normally what you're going to feel is relief. So you think maybe not viewing each position as a win or loss per se in terms of this was a success or a failure, focusing on the portfolio overall and almost ranking your positions, what you want to own the most and want to own the least. And if there's something else that you don't own and you want to get it in that circle, really thinking about, you know, maybe there's something I need to cut to, to make room for something that I think could be a, a really good position in the portfolio. Yeah, and I'll often sit down and just do a new what do I think the right weightings are today? If, if someone gave me $100 million to invest in a new portfolio, what would it look like today? And compare that to what you've got. And I, I, I like to think in terms of portfolio weightings rather than individual investments. And you know, when we're talking about buying or selling stocks that are moving, I try not to think about it in terms of buy or sell, but think about it in terms of what's the right weighting for the opportunity that's in front of me today. And then whether I buy or sell can be a, a secondary decision to that. And it might even be a stock that I really like and the business is going really well, but the weighting has gone up to such a level that it's just not the right weighting for the risk reward that's in front of me today. And that can be depend on other stocks in the portfolio, right? It might be the rest of the portfolio that's fallen. I think we might've talked about RUL, RPM Global. I'm not sure on the show before, but anyway, that's our largest position. And because it's done relatively well over the past year, it's weighting has gone from six to almost 8% in our portfolio. So I think just think waiting rather than buy or sell is a really good is a really good process. Yeah, and I mean, if you do find something, if you're a retail or, or a pro and you've either fully invested or want to keep a certain amount of cash on the side, there's nothing wrong with selling 5% of each of your holdings and adding a new holding that is the biggest holding in your portfolio, if you like. You're not, everything, every decision doesn't have to be binary, does it? I either love this stock or I hate it. You can sort of, shave down a manoeuvre to, to get the portfolio allocation you like. Is that fair? Yeah, that's ab absolutely right. And I think a lot of people do think like that, that, you know, I've got to substitute this stock for something else. And that's usually not the case, right? Usually you've either got a bit of cash in your portfolio or you can, you can take some money off the table on 10 other things to make room for the new one that you want to put in. I do usually recommend, and I do myself, ease my way into most new investments. You never really know a stock until you own it has been my experience. Yeah. And I think that that initial six months, you know, you, you always want to have a thesis that's differentiated from the market. So 
I think I know something about this business that the current price does not reflect. You're going to be wrong about that fairly regularly. And, and from my experience, you work that out in the first six months of, of owning a business, whether the market was right or you were right. You just start to see things and you have more interaction with the business and you pick up a couple of reports and you mm, that just doesn't quite feel right. So my preference is to ease into my maximum weightings, even if that weighting on day one is is a 4%, I might just start with two and just say, look, I just want to get to know this business over time here. I like the opportunity. I want to make some money if the share price moves quickly in the short term, but I also want to get to know the stock. We've spoken about selling winners, uh, selling losers or, and, or adding to losers if, if there's still value there. What about the psychological challenges around selling things that have been huge winners? Um, yeah, what, what are some of the biases people have that, that preclude them from doing that when they, when they should? Well, I think that's a lesson that more people have learned over the past 12 months yeah. than, <laughs> than at any point over the past 10 years, because yeah, we, we, had a, we had a 10 year bull market in high quality companies. They started from very reasonable valuations and for 10 years, uh, things got more and more and more expensive. And the lesson for that, from that for a lot of people was you just buy and hold these companies and you can't ever go wrong. And you know, a lot of those are down 50, 60, 70% over the past year. So I think one of the things in investing in it, I don't have any rules that are not breakable in certain circumstances. I think there are some really good rules of thumb out there. Ride your winners and sell your losers. There are reasons why that is often true and often the right thing to do. And there are also really important exceptions when everything that might be good about a company's future is, is priced into the share price. There is no substitute for paying the right price for a stock, and there's no there's no uh, compensating for paying too much for a stock either. So, I do think it's really important to recognise. Okay, I'm on something. I've invested in something here. It's going really well. I'm biased towards owning it for a really long time, but I also have a price and a valuation level where I'm going to say I am going to move on here because there is just too much downside. In, in this not working out perfectly, which is how it's priced for the future. Uh, our international fund, we, we were plus 80% in 2021, and we were minus 39% in 2022. And a lot of it was exactly the same stocks. They went up threefold in 2022. We sold almost every stock. We sold some of it. You know, we, we halved it, or we, we even in some cases cut three quarters of our, our investment but the share price fell 60 or 70% over the next 12 months. And we clearly should have taken all of the money off the table at those quite exuberant prices. So again, for me, it's all about what is the right weighting given the opportunity in front of me today. I do think you've got to think about the tax man, especially retail investors. You know, you've got a tax-free loan from the government from not realizing your capital gains. So you need to weigh, weigh that up but I do think you need to have a zero weighting. You need to have a price in your mind when you start out that is at this level, I am going to be a zero and be really disciplined about that when, you, when you're in a bull market and when the environment is very positive. You mentioned the, the, the taxation issue there. Certainly the tax loss selling this year felt quite brutal as well. Have you seen you know, a lot of things I was holding that were down really got crunched leading into the financial year and they've, they've bounced uh, sharply since some of them. Did you find that was pretty exacerbated this year when, when some of the investors were sitting on losses leading to the end of financial year? Yeah, people talk about it every year. From my experience, it's most common in years where you've got huge, huge drawdowns. You know, some of these tech stocks that we own were down 70 and 80% from some people's purchase prices. So you think about what's going through even a fund manager's mind at the end of the tax year that, well, I can sell this stock for 20 cents of what I bought it for. I'm getting 80 cents of losses here. Whether I sell it for 20 or 15 or 10 yeah. doesn't really make a huge difference because the value of the loss that's being realized. And if you're a fund manager, that's distribution that you don't have to pay out of your fund at the end of the year. So I think particularly in some of those quite popular small cap tech stocks, it was it was extreme this year. And we had a little internal huddle two weeks prior to the end of the year we've got our maximum weightings in these stocks. I want you to be there by the 30th of June because I really think this is the, the most depressed environment we're going to see for those stocks. So I, I don't have any doubt that it was a big factor in, in 2022. I'd caution people about using it as a rationale. You know, if something's only down 20 or 
I think often you sit there and say, well, this is tax loss selling and yeah. there is something much more to what's going on than an irrational tax loss selling. But uh, uh, when the magnitude of the losses over the year is extreme, you're going to get even more extreme selling. And uh, I'm switching gears a bit. How are you viewing markets Markets overall? What are you talking about with your team and on a sort of six to 12 month, month basis? How are you viewing uh, How are you viewing things? I've never seen a bigger disconnect between how businesses are currently performing and how the market is valuing them because there is an assumption that things are going to get dramatically worse. I think everyone can agree that things are going to get worse. Interest rates are up, inflation is high. There's lots of reasons why the consumer is going to be in a more difficult place. But I feel like particularly at the smaller end of the market, it's been massively overdone in terms of how bad it is going to get. And I don't know whether that means the market is going to turn anytime soon, but I know that if you own some of these businesses over the next five years and you ride through whatever the next 12 months is going to look like, uh, I think you're going to do very, very, very well. And particularly if you focus on businesses that are going to enhance their competitive position if there is a downturn. You know, I sit there and I say, some of these stocks are cheap if there's no downturn. You own a we don't actually own the stock, so I need to caveat that with this, but I think Nick Scully at the moment, it's a really interesting example of people are assuming that we're going into Armageddon with that business. Uh, they have a wonderful business. They've got a good track record of acquiring things. If we do go through an Armageddon environment, they are going to survive and they're probably going to do some things that make them a much better business out the other side of it. So. I, I don't know in terms of the market. Like I said, I, I've never seen it this momentum driven before. Um, so predicting that that's going to stop would be fairly futile. But for us, we're just focused on the businesses that we're buying and we're really happy with the progress that they're making. And, you know, there's stocks out there that are growing very nicely trading at single digit multiples of earnings. So I'm pretty optimistic about what the, the five and 10 year returns look like from here. And what's your cash balance like compared to where it usually is? Very low. Uh, we, we'd be down to 2% in our Australian fund, fund of cash and in our international fund, we'd be about six. And the other thing that we've done is skew more towards the smaller cap end of the market from, you know, we, we, we still own some. So tech, I mean, tech's been dash small than anything, in, in, mostly in the tech space and that smaller cap or, or broadly across different industries? No, it is broader than that. They're our biggest weightings. We we have about a third of the portfolio in enterprise technology fairly broadly defined at the moment, which is very, very big for us. But there's lots of other stocks out there. We own Viva Leisure. We own Healthier. Uh, right. So Viva Leisure is a gyms operator. That share price is down 40%. The business is ahead of where they promised they were going to be six months ago. It's recovering really nicely. So I do think there are some more economically exposed businesses that are pretty interesting at the moment as well. And then stocks like Downer for us have done their job. We bought them to be fairly defensive in a market like this. Um, we haven't made lots of money out of it, but the stock price has held up pretty well and you've collected a couple of dividends. For us, it's time to start thinking about those as a form of cash for us as well and shifting it more into some of the, the smaller cap, higher return opportunities. And just getting back to something you touched on earlier, how there's a disconnect between what you're seeing in, in the results and the, the, the prices of a lot of these stocks. I mean, the stock market's not the economy. You hear that thrown around a lot and it is the lead indicator. What should investors look for? Is it a six to nine month leading indicator or what sort of time frame do you think it puts on? Because when we do hit recession, chances are that the, the stock market may be, be going up shortly after that, that happens and it always seems to catch people by surprise. Yeah, I don't know that there's a fixed time on that. I, I've never seen it this this early in terms of we are fully pricing a hundred percent chance of a very significant recession before before it's actually happened. The lead indicators in the US do look pretty horrible outside of employment, which is a, a lagging indicator. They absolutely do. So consumer confidence looks terrible, investor confidence looks terrible. But we just had Bank of America out two days ago saying we have no escalation in in bad debts problems yet that is true through the middle of july they're, they're not just talking about the past quarter consumers are still spending unemployment as you touched on it, it is the big one right and i think I, i'm not arguing against the case here that it's going to get worse it is clearly likely that it's going to get worse but i, I think to your point 
people have got 2008, nine in their heads that we're going into this massive consumer recession, balance sheet repair. I think we're going into this recession, particularly in the US, with much healthier consumer balance sheets than last time around. And I think the 1990s recession is maybe a better guide to, okay, it's fairly shallow and maybe not the dramatic increases in unemployment that you've seen before. But I don't even think you need to predict that at the moment. I think if you're long-term enough to look through it, you just look at some of today's prices for the equities and say, well, I can navigate that environment if I stick to the stronger, better balance sheet businesses, even if it is really bad, okay, I'll lose a year's earnings, but three or four years time, I I own a business that's trading on six times earnings or something like that. So I I think the market, the market can start pricing some different scenarios pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, in the U S you've seen a week of a fairly dramatic change in some of the perceptions around this stuff. So, I don't I don't have the faintest idea whether this is the bottom or not, but I know from past experience that it can happen pretty quickly. So my view is just be where you, you want to be, invest in the opportunities that you see in front of you at that point in time. And if the market goes lower, we navigate that environment. We take a bit more of our safer, resilient stuff off the table and we invest more of it in, in the deeply distressed uh, things. We've still got plenty of things that we can do on that front if things get worse, but I think the prospects from here are, are really good for equities. And, and I know that that's not the consensus view of the world at the moment. There's a lot of very smart investors out there saying it's too early, it's too early, it's too early. But yeah, I just like what I see in front of me in terms of price and, and value. There's like a buy the dip message. I'd say buy the dip and put it in the bottom drawer and try not to look at it too often. Yeah. <laughs> a lesson from environments like this. Awesome, mate. Really appreciate your time as always. It was, uh, it was a great recap and a lot of people get a heap out of that. So really appreciate your time, mate. Great, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Dave. This episode of Talk Your Book was proudly brought to you by Honan, who go beyond a transactional insurance broker to deliver better outcomes for their clients. If you're enjoying Talk Your Book, make sure you subscribe to Chris Judd Invest.